This is the DJI Mini 3 Pro, which has got a camera well beyond what you'd expect on a sub 250 gram drone. In fact, most of the parameters, functions and specs are right up there with the Air 2S and even the Mavic 3. So today, we're gonna to have a look through the various camera settings, what they do and where they're located. Hello, I'm Ian and I play with drones. And look, a quick or maybe not so quick video today outlining the main features and settings of the DJI Mini 3 Pro. Now look, this model from DJI has taken the standards and specifications of its camera straight from its bigger siblings, I think. Uh, so I think it's pretty important to know what this mighty little drone can do so you can get the very best out of it. It's got um, a large sensor, one over 1.3, 0.8 inch uh, sensor, 48 megapixels via a uh, quad bayer filter. It's got a fixed aperture of uh, f1.7, lets you shoot 4K video at 60 frames per second, or at 1080, you can do slow-mo at 120 frames per second. And recently it's added 10-bit color added to its d cine like color profile, which is genuinely incredible for a drone this size, as well as having a HDR video along with JPEG and RAW and still. So look, a lot to go on. So let's go through the various settings and how you can actually set the various parameters. There are three main areas of settings to go through. The main settings are accessed in the drone's own main settings menu from the top three dots in the top right. You've also got the type of shot you're taking. That's accessed on screen from the icon just above the shutter button. And then you have the parameters that affect how the picture or video is taken. And that's they're accessed along the bottom right of the screen. So a lot to get through because they have different settings depending on whether you're in camera or video mode. So let's kick off. Go to the top uh, right three dots, the main settings, you'll see five separate tabs. Second one is control. Now, inside the control tab are actually some very useful settings that will affect how smoothly the camera moves. So they're not camera settings as such, but they will affect how you take pictures or film video. And I did a separate smooth it out video. Uh, I put a link up there. It goes through all of the different settings inside there that will help smooth out the turns and how, the, uh, how your drone actually flies to get smoother video. So I said, I'll put a link up there and I'll also link to the video uh, at the end of this video as well. But for today, I'm gonna go into the next tab. There we've got it called camera. And this is where we set the settings for the camera and screen. Now, as I said, annoyingly, these settings will actually change depending on whether you start off in camera mode or video mode. So first off, let's stay in camera mode and then we'll quickly run through them. First setting is the photo and video format, four to three or 16 to nine widescreen. Personal choice here. To me, 16.9 is simply cropping the top and bottom of the full size sensor. So some people prefer not to do that, leave it in full frame and crop as they want. Others, like myself, want the settings to match my phone, laptop, PC, and TV screen. So I do keep it in 16 to nine so that I don't have to crop all the time. Like I said, your choice. Next though, histogram. This is simply a little exposure meter that can appear on screen as you're filming. It's a useful little feature that helps you gauge the right exposure. And this is where it's turned off and on. Next, you've got a really useful and interesting little feature that frankly, I'm pretty amazed that they have included in the Mini 3, but I'm happy they did. Focus peaking is an overlay on screen that appears and helps with focusing when you're in manual focus mode. It shows the areas of the picture that are perfectly in focus with a red tinge. One of the most annoying tricks you can do is to start recording video at takeoff and the camera will just focus on the ground right in front of it. And then you take off up into the air and you find that the rest of your video is out of focus and your video is ruined. This has happened to me a couple of times. Focus peaking will help avoid this and the level simply sets how strong the red tinge you want this overlay to be. For me, I leave it on normal. It gives a slight red tinge, which reassures me that everything is in focus and the world is good. Play around with it. Too much might be a bit distracting, but a very useful feature. And below that, you've got the overexposure warning. Now look, this is where you switch on the black and white zebra lines that will show you if any part of the picture is overexposed, which in almost every case is going to be the sky. So personally, I leave this off because the, uh, the high contrast between the sky and subjects on the ground mean that the sky is almost always gonna be overexposed. So I get the ground subject right. Again, as ever, personal choice. Next up or next down is the grid lines. Again, this is a useful on-screen tool for just aligning things, making sure that the horizon is, is level. Um, I like the middle option personally. 
offer that splits things into thirds. There's uh, a preference that landscape photography and video usually looks better with uh, a third and two thirds between the sky and the ground or subjects or whatever. But look, again, personal preference, um, choose what you want. Now the last options of white balance and recordings are actually duplicated on another screen that I'm going to go through in a second. So uh, we'll leave them for now. So for now I want to jump right out and change the mode to video mode. Uh, do that by tapping uh, just above the uh, shutter button and you can change it to video. Then we hop back into the main settings via those three dots top right and now you can see the camera tab has got some slightly different options. First option is the format. Uh, now look, it used to be that was it, Macs liked Move and Windows liked MP4s, but in truth, look, both systems can handle both uh, video formats these days. Personally, I leave mine in MP4. Below you have the color profile. Now, normal, I find is fine for everyday use, but DCine-like introduces 10-bit colors. And the thing to remember though, is whilst 10-bit colors are great, the DCine-like profile will require further enhancing in a program like Premiere Pro or some other video editing software afterwards. So only use DCine-like if you're fully expecting to process the video afterwards in post. Otherwise, you're going to find all the colors washed out and it will be actually quite disappointing. So personally, leave it in normal most times. Below that, you've got your coding format. Uh, now look, I, I use 264 because that's the easiest to upload to YouTube. 265 is a newer compression format that will make your PC work much harder, but does allow for better compression. So for me, I tend to leave it in 264. Video subtitles, that's useful. It's not actually putting anything on screen. It's simply capturing additional data about how and where the video was captured, what the camera was doing, and it produces a separate little SRT file alongside your main video file. I leave it on because it's nice to be able to go back and check out what the camera was doing at a particular point. But in truth, unless you go looking for it, you're not even going to see the data in the first place. So don't, don't worry too much. Lastly, we've got anti-flickering. This is simply about avoiding street lights, or if you're filming inside, then um, inside lights um, that may appear to flicker depending on uh, the frame rate that you're shooting in versus the cycle of the mains electricity that's lighting the lights. UK and Europe, we're on 50 hertz. US, I think, is 60 hertz. But it also, as I said, depends on the frame rate you're using. So to me, leave it on auto. Don't worry about it. Let it look after itself. Now the other settings are either the same as photo or are duplicated on the next screen that we're going to look at. So that is the main settings via the three dots. Now we can take a look at how we affect and change the actual settings of the picture and video that we're taking down in the bottom right. Now again, these will change depending on whether you're in camera mode or video mode. So first off, let's get back into camera mode. Make sure the little indicator at the bottom right says auto. This means the camera is going to pretty much look after the exposure and the ISO itself. Uh, yeah, I always get comments on that. To me, it's ISO, not ISO. Uh, ISO is a short name given and owned and used by the International Organization for Standardization. They want us to say ISO, so that's what I say. No matter what I say, I'm going to get comments, which makes me laugh. But anyway, we're digressing. Bottom right, camera mode, auto. Let's have a look at what is going on there. Uh, in camera mode, we've just got a few options. First of all, you've got EV or exposure value. This is a simple sliding dial to increase or decrease the exposure or the brightness of the picture. Dial it up to make it brighter, dial it down to make it darker. It's that simple. It's useful when you've got bright sky in shop, you want the focus of the ground subjects and it's something you will adjust quite frequently when flying and taking shots. Now the other two items, less so. You will pretty much know in advance whether or not you're going to be shooting just JPEGs or JPEGs plus RAW. RAW files are not compressed. They will take up far more space on your SD card, but they allow you way more editing freedom when uh, editing in a program like Photoshop. So look, if you've got the space, leave it in JPEG plus RAW. You'll have the ease of JPEGs, but you'll have the freedom of a RAW file if you need to work on something to get it looking its very best. Storage, of course, simply shows you how full your micro SD card is and the internal storage is. So that's actually it for auto. Now let's go into manual mode or pro as DJI call it. If you tap the little auto uh, icon at the bottom right, you can see it takes it into pro mode. Now you see the options have changed slightly along the bottom right. 
They're actually just split into two groups. Uh, you've got exposure on the right and you've got white balance on the left and they're separated by a small little vertical white line. On the right, you can see four values. S is shutter speed, F is the aperture, ISO is the sensor sensitivity and MM is manual metering. Now, I don't wanna go into too much detail here. It's not a photography lesson, but when you're taking pictures, you have something called the exposure triangle, which is how aperture, ISO and shutter speed all interact to give you your resulting picture. Aperture is literally how big the, hole, the lens hole is, how much light it's gonna get in. Uh, on the Mini 3, it's fixed at uh, f1.7. Uh, so this value will always show 1.7. But ISO and shutter speed are adjustable, of course, and the manual metering shows you the overall result of the combined settings on how under or overexposed it thinks your picture will be. So when you tap the right side, you get the little pop-up menu. And here is where you set the ISO. The lower the value, the less sensitive the sensor is to light and the darker the picture will be. But you always want the lowest value possible for the sharpest shots. So on a bright sunny day like today, 100 is gonna be the value to go for. But around dusk in the evening, you might wanna increase it to 400 or even 800. I know it goes much higher, but in truth, I rarely go above 400. I, don't, I want to avoid the uh, grainy noise that you might sometimes get. Then you've got the shutter speed, which increases or decreases how fast the shutter stays open. The larger the bottom figure or the denominator is, the faster the shutter speed. And of course, the less light that's going to get in, and so the darker the picture will be. Of course, there's no right value here. It just depends on how bright the uh, day is when you're actually filming. But you've got help at hand through the manual metering below it. That bottom value is not adjustable. It simply indicates how under or over exposed the picture is likely to be based on the ISO and the shutter speed that you've selected. So it's a really useful little uh, bit of information. The closer to zero you are, I think the closer to perfection you are, but again, as ever, personal choice. So look, let's hop over to the left here. Here, the pop-up offers you the chance to play with white balance, which affects how warm or cold the picture will be. Now, interestingly, despite being in manual pro mode, it still offers you an auto option, but it's actually, I think, quite useful to keep this uh, in manual mode because it is great for warming up a cloudy and overcast day. You've got this sliding scale uh, that shows how you can adjust the white balance in degrees Kelvin. The higher the K value you set, the warmer the resulting picture will be. Now, some people do think they've got it the wrong way around because normally a higher K value represents cooler light. But remember, you're adjusting the sensor to compensate for a colder background light, so the resulting picture will be warmer. Bottom line, higher value, warmer picture, useful to play around, uh, as, as I said, especially on grey and cloudy days. And then below that, you've got the same file formats and storage settings that you had from before. So, Look, without further ado, let's jump into video mode and then we can take a look at this uh, lower right thing again. So back to auto and set it into video mode. And now we see you have the EV or the exposure value again, quickly letting you adjust the brightness. But next to that, you now have the resolution and the frame rate. This lets you dial the resolution up and whilst I tend to leave mine in 4K, many will find that 2.7K is more than enough resolution for their needs. Remember, that's still higher definition than Blu-ray, and it takes up way, way less storage. Um, below that, you've got frames per second. And look, being in the UK, I tend to use 25 frames per second. In the US, most people will use 30 frames a second. Look, it's a little difference these days, as almost all TV screens and computer monitors can handle uh, whichever frame rate you want to use. But the crucial thing to remember is that these settings are simply for normal playback. If you want slow motion video, you'll need to set that via the camera mode icon, which we'll go through in a minute, uh, and choose slow-mo. This will then enable the slow-mo frames per second in the bottom screen. Easy to forget that. Finally, wow, let's jump into pro mode again by tapping the bottom right logo to change it to pro. Just as before, you've got two main menus with a little white line up the middle. The right side is similar to camera settings. It lets you uh, adjust the ISO and the shutter speed and you see the resulting manual metering mode display 
will change accordingly depending on what you select above. And again, when we tap the left side, the little pop-up menu appears showing you the white balance and below that, this is where you set the resolution or the frame rate setting. So again, remember that frame rate value will change if you've got the camera mode in slow-mo mode versus standard video mode. But look, as before, have a play, especially with the white balance as it is a great way to warm up those sunsets and sunrises. So that's everything for the main camera settings. Fair bit to remember there, and in truth, I find auto is actually fine for most situations. The only thing you're gonna be adjusting is the EV settings if you want things brighter or darker, and possibly the white balance if you wanna warm things up on a gloomy, cloudy day. Now, the last group of settings is the camera mode itself, and you set that by tapping the icon above the shutter button. This is where you can set the type of shot you're taking. It includes the high resolution still shot of uh, 48 megapixels, in truth, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, remember, this is actually a 12 megapixel sensor. You're getting those effective 48 million pixels via a quad Bayer filter in front. Um, so I tend to stick in 12 megs because I think that's the better, the better end result. Anyway, this is where you'll also set the um, AEB or auto exposure bracketed, which takes three or five near identical shots with differing exposure values for you to work on afterwards and merge in Photoshop. You've also got burst shots, which is uh, a quick succession of shots to capture something that's very fast moving. And finally, you've got the timer for the self-timer shot, so you can hide the remote and smile at the drone. In the video side, you're going to have slow-mo video, as I said. You've also got master shots, and you've got quick shots, and the hyperlapse and the panoramas, which look, in truth, an utterly, utterly incredible range of functions. And in truth, that would be a whole other video for another day. So for now, I'm gonna to have to leave things here. This is where you change them. Have a play, have a little bit of experimentation. You get a lot of pop-up information on what those various uh, functions are gonna do. But look, here you are. You've got the full range of settings. Sorry if this went on a fair bit. That's what happens when you've got so many options on such an amazing little bit of kit. But look, I really need a cup of tea now. So have a play with some of those settings, especially the EV and the white balance, as I said, see what works for you. And as ever, give me a little thumbs up. Always helps the cause. As usual, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, till next time, have fun, happy flying.